and hope you're all safe and hunkered down at home. Uh, this is the first in a series of live streams we're going to do uh, where Lowell astronomers will tell you a little about their research, some of their interests in astronomy. Uh, what I'd like to do today is take you on a bit of a tour of the cosmic landscape. Uh, and towards the end, I'll try and uh, talk a little bit about my own research in this area uh, as time allows. But the idea, as the title says, is to give you an overview of what the universe looks like on the very largest scales. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, at the end as well. Uh, so you can uh, put those in, in the live chat and we'll answer them at the end. Uh, so if you think about it, humans have always been curious about where are we? Where do we live? Uh, this is a map from 1570 showing what people thought the world looked like. And you'll see, it's not bad, right? I mean, you can sort of recognize uh, North America and Africa, Europe and Asia. South America looks a little sad, not really what we think it looks like today. Uh, but of course, it's really hard to map the earth uh, when you're sitting on its surface, right? And it was a long, hard work to get a more accurate, more precise map of what our world looks like. So here's what it looked like according to a 1664 map. And again, you see, okay, now South America looks a bit better and all the continents, it's not perfect, of course, but uh, it's definitely looking better than, than previous. And finally, by the time you get to the uh, 18th century, it's a pretty decent map, right? You know, all the continents are recognizable uh, and, you know, we've come a long way. And if you think about it, astronomy, we often think of astronomers as stargazers, but in a sense, astronomers are map makers more than anything. We try to figure out where are we in the universe? Where are we located? Where's our solar system? Where's our galaxy? And that's the kind of thing I want to talk about today. How have humans been able to figure out our location? Going beyond just where uh, land masses are on our planet, but where are the masses and the matter distributed throughout space as well? The first depiction of the starry sky of the heavens uh, was done almost 4,000 years ago. It's called the Nebra Disk. It was discovered in Germany and was made by Bronze Age people. And it depicted the, the sky, the stars, as they saw it. And so if you look at this, you can see that there's obviously the sun and the moon. But you also notice that there's a, a clump of stars that you can see here, quite prominent. And that's actually the Pleiades. Uh, it's believed that's a depiction of this very well-known clump of stars that's featured prominently in many cultural le legends around the world. Uh, that was how they mapped, you know, in a sense, this is the earliest map of the heavens that human beings ever produced. Here's another map from uh, uh, China going back many centuries, uh, again, showing uh, stars and constellations in the sky, our attempt to map the universe. Here's a, a Pawnee sky chart uh, from the, the Pawnee people. Uh, and again, you see all the little marks that denote stars, but in fact, some of them are pretty prominent groups like the well-known Big Dipper, the North Star, uh, the Pleiades again feature. Uh, so again, these are early attempts to map our location, or in this case, the distribution of stars in the heavens. Now, as time went on, people became more ambitious in a sense. So William Herschel, famous astronomer, in 1785, decided that he was going to map the universe, which is a pretty <laughs> ambitious task to try and undertake. And what he did was he counted stars in all different directions of the sky. And he assumed, not unreasonably, that the fainter stars were further away. And so by doing this, he tried to map the distribution of all the stars in the universe. And this image shows his conclusion that the universe is a flattened distribution of stars. And lucky for us, the sun is located pretty close to the center. We're the center of the universe, essentially. Um, he, he turns out he was wrong. Uh, and he didn't know that, of course, but it was a pretty good attempt at the time. He was wrong because he was unaware of this stuff. This is dust in the Milky Way galaxy. These are the ashes of stars that have died, essentially. They lived, they died, some of them exploded as supernovae, and they strew their atoms, their ashes throughout space. And just like trying to look through um, a thick forest fire, through the smoke of a fire, or through fog, these 
uh, dust and ashes of dead stars blocks your view after a while. It makes it hard to see very far. The light can't penetrate through it. So what this meant was that Herschel saw only a tiny piece of <clears throat> space around him. And as we know today, our own Milky Way extends far beyond that. And of course, there are many galaxies even beyond that. But you know, Herschel's attempt was a good one. So this, for example, is what our Milky Way galaxy might look like if you could see it from far off in space. Uh, this is a very similar looking galaxy. And our sun would be located roughly about two thirds of the way out in the suburbs, essentially. And so what that means is that uh, Herschel saw only a small piece of the Milky Way galaxy and just had no idea what, what lays beyond it. But again, through no fault of his own, nobody knew that this dust or ashes of stars existed at that time. Today, we have a spacecraft called Gaia, which is busily mapping our Milky Way uh, galaxy. It's in the process of mapping the positions and the motions of a billion stars. This is what it's done so far, and it keeps repeating its observations over a series of a course of five years or more. Uh, but this is the, the best image we have at the present of where our Milky, what our Milky Way looks like from our position in the Milky Way. We're looking through the Milky Way towards the center here. You'll see at the bottom right, there are two small objects. Those are actually galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. They, they swarm around the Milky Way like bees might swarm around a hive. Um, but all the other stuff that you see is a cumulative light of stars. And the dark regions are these ashes of previous generations of stars, the dust that blocks our view and makes it hard to see what our own galaxy looks like. But there was more to uh, trying to map the universe uh, than people understood initially. In the 17 and 1800s, there were uh, discovered sort of puzzling objects in the sky that were called nebulae. nebulae. Nebula comes from the Latin word for cloud or mist, and nobody knew exactly what these things were. Many people believed that they were just some weird objects in the Milky Way galaxy. Other astronomers and scientists speculated that, no, maybe these were objects far beyond uh, anything we could imagine. They called them distant island universes. So here's one drawing from 1847. Uh, so again, an astronomer looked through it, in this case, uh, John Herschel, looked through a telescope, sorry, William Herschel, uh, looked through a telescope, um, sorry, John Herschel, uh, looked through a telescope and drew what he saw. Uh, this is another picture of one of these nebulae in 1845, had a kind of puzzling, almost whirlpool or spiral structure. Here's another one from 1849. So nobody knew what these things were. They were a great puzzle. Finally, the person that figured it out was Edwin Hubble, who in the 1920s was able to show that in fact, many of these nebulae were distant island universes. These were systems of stars like the Milky Way, but much, much further away than anything anybody had ever imagined before. The way he did this was he took a photograph of one of the biggest and best known nebulae called the Andromeda Nebula, because it's located in the constellation of Andromeda. And he detected certain kinds of stars in this nebula. And by measuring how faint they were, he could infer how far away they must be. And the conclusion was that this Andromeda Nebula, or now Andromeda Galaxy as we call it today, was way beyond the Milky Way. So here's a modern photograph of what the Andromeda Galaxy looks like. And we know it's about 2 million light years away. So if you go out on any night when it's clear, you can see Andromeda galaxy. You're seeing light into your eye that traveled for 2 million years to reach here. Uh, it turns out this is our nearest big neighboring galaxy in space. It's about probably 50% or so bigger than the Milky Way. Uh, and in fact, it turns out, oh, sorry, I was going to show you this. This is today's astronomy picture of the day. So if you like APOD, if you like astronomy picture of the day, this is astronomy picture of the day today. It is the Andromeda galaxy. It's a really cool picture a photographer did. Uh, it's a composite, but a real photograph in the sense that he took a long multiple exposures and stacked them to get the Andromeda galaxy. And with the same camera from the same location, he took uh, a picture of this foreground uh, building and put them together. So this is today's astronomy picture of the day. It turns out that we and Andromeda are on a collision course with each other, we're destined to crash 
in about 4 billion years or so. And I'm going to show you a computer uh, simulation of what that might look like. So this is a computer model of what our Milky Way galaxy might appear as. So all the stars, including the sun, going round and round. On the bottom right, by the way, you'll see time uh, from now. So this is a billion years from now, uh, et cetera. There's the Andromeda galaxy at the bottom left. And the Milky Way and Andromeda, gravity is pulling them relentlessly towards each other. And you'll see what happens. As they get closer and closer, the two galaxies are first going to fly right through each other. And you see a spray of stars, which carries away energy and momentum, and is eventually going to allow these two galaxies to come back together, gravity doesn't stop, and merge into one larger galaxy about 5 billion years from now, which astronomers have cleverly named Melchameda. Uh, and that's the future. People often ask what's going to happen to the sun in the solar system when the, uh, the two galaxies merge. Um, first of all, don't worry about it, it's 5 billion years from now. Uh, but then uh, nothing will happen to the sun in the solar system because the distance between stars are so enormous that when Andromeda and the Milky Way merge, uh, no stars, virtually no stars will hit each other. So the planets will continue to orbit the sun and the sun will become part of this new larger galaxy and that's it. Put in perspective, if you get in your car right now and drive to the sun, 60 miles an hour, no stopping for donuts, it would take you uh, 177 years to reach the sun. If you got in that same car and drove to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, it would take you 50 million years to reach the nearest star. So I mean, there's a lot of empty space between the stars. And so when galaxies merge like this, no stars are ever gonna hit each other, basically. So that's the future of the Milky Way and Andromeda. <clears throat> but there are many, many galaxies out there, of course, besides those two. This is an image, uh, actually it's a, a sort of animation fly through what's called the Hubble Deep Field. The Hubble Deep Field is a region of the sky that the Hubble Space Telescope observed over the course of about 11 days and just recorded as much light as it could, like keeping your camera shutter open for 11 days. Uh, and this was chosen to be a really boring piece of sky, nothing interesting going on there, just a typical region of the universe. Uh, the little uh, diagram at the bottom left actually shows the field that was imaged relative to the size of the moon, for example. Um, and in this little tiny piece of sky, more than 10,000 galaxies were discovered. And so if you extrapolate, if you assume that this is a typical region of the sky, and on average, every region of the sky has similar number of galaxies, that means there are hundreds of billions, probably a trillion or more galaxies in the universe uh, when, you, when you include all the faint small ones that even Hubble can't see, for example. And so what that suggests is a universe chock full of galaxies, and we can use those galaxies as luminous beacons to map the universe on the largest scales. If you look at the Earth, for example, and you look at satellite images like this, you see that the lights tell us where human beings live, of course, but they also trace the land masses of our planet. And we can do the same thing using galaxies to trace the matter distribution, if you like, the land masses of the cosmos. And so that's what astronomers have been doing uh, ever since Hubble first discussed, even before Hubble first realized that these galaxies are in fact very, very far away. One of the first things that becomes obvious is that galaxies are very gregarious. Galaxies like hanging out together. And the reason, of course, is gravity. Gravity brings things together. So it's very rare to find a single isolated galaxy. You usually find galaxies in groups or, or even bigger systems. Here's another one. Uh, again, these are all galaxies uh, held together in a sort of you know, uh, gravitational waltz moving around each other uh, under gravity's pull. Our Milky Way and Andromeda live in a small village of galaxies that we call the local group. Astronomers are not clever with their names. Uh, so it's called the local group. Uh, and so in the upper left, you can see Andromeda. Uh, and it's, it's surrounded by several small galaxies. Most galaxies in the universe are actually quite small, smaller than the Milky Way. Uh, and so there's a sort of retinue of galaxies swarming around Andromeda. And likewise, the Milky Way galaxy down at the bottom right also has its own entourage of small galaxies 
that uh, follow it around everywhere too, held by its gravitational uh, pull. So that's our cosmic village, the local group. It's got on the order of 30, 40, 50, the, the exact number is still not known yet, uh, 30, 40, 50 galaxies uh, in our little village. Uh, there are new ones still being discovered all the time, faint ones that have escaped detection to date. Uh, but there are other even bigger conglomerations of galaxies. And these are called clusters of galaxies. These are the cities of the universe, essentially. This is the nearest uh, city. So this is, you know, if the local group is like the flagstaff of the universe, this is more like the phoenix of the universe. This is the Virgo cluster located about 50 million light years away. And you see just countless galaxies. There are hundreds, probably thousands of galaxies throughout the Virgo cluster. Uh, they're all held together by gravity. They're all moving slowly around each other. But these are the, again, these are the big cities of the cosmos. Here's another one, the Coma Cluster. This is located about 300 million light years from Earth. Uh, you see it's got these two giant galaxies at the center, but many, many smaller galaxies surrounding them and in fact extending quite far out. Um, so again, this would be like, you know, the, the Tokyo of the cosmos or the New York City of the cosmos. Here's another example. This is a really beautiful uh, cluster of galaxies. This is located about 2 billion light years away. This is called Abel 1689. And almost everything you see in this image is a galaxy. Uh, everything that's got that sort of yellow orange color is, is a galaxy all moving around each other, all held together by gravity's pull. Here's another example called Abel 370. You might notice these beautiful blue arcs, and I won't really talk about these just for lack of time, but what those are, oops, sorry. What those are is called gravitational lensing. That's like a funhouse mirror bending the light from galaxies much, much further behind. It produces kind of optical illusion. And I, if you have questions, I can talk about it at the end. I'd be happy to. Um, just to put in perspective, those giant cities of galaxies, again, like you said, the, the Tokyos, the, the Sao Paulos of the, war, of the cosmos, if this is our local group shown here in this image, so you see the Milky Way, again, down here, and the Andromeda galaxy here, the space between them in those congested cities of galaxies would be filled with hundreds of galaxies all moving around each other. So they're just far, far, far more populous, far more densely populated than our little village of galaxies is. Here's another one, a really beautiful one, located about 5 billion light years uh, away. And again, you can see these arcs, again, these gravitational lensed images, that sort of thing. Now, as you know, living in a big city can be rough. Uh, there's dangers everywhere. You have to be a little bit careful, you know, looking over your shoulder. There's a lot more people, a lot more stuff can happen. And the same thing is true in these galaxy clusters where there's so many galaxies. You know, if you try and walk down the street of Los Angeles, you may well bump into somebody, right, in the denser areas. Likewise with galaxies, if you pack so many galaxies into a fairly small region of space, they're going to bump into each other. And it doesn't always end well, especially for the little galaxies. Here's an example of a galaxy, oops, sorry, that's kind of pulled a plume of material off of another galaxy, kind of stretching it out like taffy. Uh, uh, because they pass too close together. Here's another example. I really love this image. This is three galaxies, maybe four actually, uh, all just kind of tearing bits and pieces off of each other uh, as they get too close in, in dense environments. Here's another example of two galaxies that will probably merge eventually uh, if you come back in a few million or billion years or so. Um, this is a beautiful image of, and again, a, a cluster of galaxies. You can see all the galaxies here. And these two have gotten too close, and this bigger one here has just torn a strip off of uh, this uh, other galaxy. And eventually, its stars will just sort of drift off into space as orphans. They won't even belong to this galaxy uh, in the future. So it's a pretty violent cosmos out there, especially if you're in one of these cities of galaxies, these clusters of galaxies. There's just a lot of stuff that can happen. Here's another beautiful image. This is a galaxy. You don't even see the galaxy anymore. This is the ghostly remains of a galaxy that's strayed too close to this other larger one. And just as you know, if a, if a, a jet fighter breaks up in flight, the pieces keep moving along the original flight path for a 
while. That's what happened here. A galaxy strayed too close to this bigger one, got torn to pieces, but its stars continued to follow the original galaxy's orbit, at least for a while. And that's what you see here, this kind of uh, this ghostly remains of what was once a, a normal small galaxy. This is a picture some colleagues and I took a few years ago using the Gemini telescope in, in Chile. Uh, and this is one of the biggest galaxies, perhaps the biggest galaxy in the local universe. And it's a cannibal. Galaxy cannibalism is really common. It's one of my own areas of research. Uh, big galaxies eat smaller galaxies and inherit their stars and inherit their gas and their dust and everything else. And this is an example of sort of galaxy cannibalism in the extreme. This giant galaxy is in the process of devouring four, possibly five other galaxies. And this galaxy is enormous. It's a beast. You could probably fit dozens of Milky Way galaxies inside of this thing, right? And this is really common. We know the Milky Way has cannibalized other galaxies. We see it cannibalizing some now, or we see the remains of some galaxies that it cannibalized in the past. Here's a computer simulation showing the birth of a large galaxy like this. And just watch it for a second. So the way these simulations work is you put in a bunch of particles that represent stars, you put in the law of gravity, and you let her rip, basically. And this galaxy builds up by cannibalizing countless smaller ones over time. And that's how they grow to their bloated sizes. The more mass they have, the more gravity they have, the more they can pull in even more victims. Uh, and that's how these giant galaxies have reached their giant sizes today. So especially in clusters of galaxies, which is where we find the biggest galaxies, they have a lot of victims uh, that they can cannibalize. And that's what we see. Oops, sorry. So as we try and go beyond and look at the universe on even larger scales, beginning in the 1980s in particular, and the development of more powerful telescopes and more efficient instruments, it became possible to measure the distances of many, many galaxies. And by doing this, it became possible for the first time to make a kind of three-dimensional map of the universe. At the bottom here, you see one of the first attempts. Uh, it, was by, uh, it was led by Margaret Geller and John Hucker, two famous astronomers at Harvard, who uh, did a survey, a very painstaking when they did this. It was a Herculean effort uh, to measure the distances of galaxies one by one and plot their distribution throughout the universe. Now, how do you measure the distance to a galaxy? There's many ways that you can do this, but the simplest way is we know the universe is expanding and we know that more distant galaxies are moving away from us faster. So by measuring how fast the galaxy is moving away from us, we can measure its distance effectively. And so each dot in this image represents a galaxy. And when you look at the bottom, which is the first, what was called the Center for Astrophysics Survey, you see galaxies are not distributed at random. You see there's these enormous structures of galaxies. They seem to lie in these kind of um, patterns. At the top shows another uh, extension using uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And again, you see these enormous structures of galaxies that extend for hundreds of millions of light years. These are just enormous structures in the universe. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This particular structure is called the Sloan Great Wall. So these are sort of Herculean efforts that were undertaken to try and map the universe on the largest scales. And it's led to the conclusion that there's just the distribution of galaxies follows something that we call the cosmic web. There's this uh, intricate network of luminous filaments of galaxies distributed throughout space. Uh, they're sort of if you like luminous strands woven together. You can see that in this image. This is a plot on the sky of galaxies uh, roughly 100 to 200 million light years away from us. Each dot represents a galaxy again. And you see these beautiful, long, linear or quasi-linear features, these filaments, with the galaxies strung out almost like beads on a string. And so the question, of course, is where does this structure come from? Why does the universe have this structure on a large scale? Why are galaxies distributed in this way? Here's another beautiful image. This is a region that's called the Perseus-Pisces supercluster. Today, astronomers recognize 
certain regions of space, almost as structures. Just as we, re we recognize continents on the Earth, we recognize, in a sense, the equivalent of continents in the universe. One is the Perseus Pisces supercluster. Every dot in this image represents a galaxy. So this is a plot on a map of the sky. For people who are familiar with astronomy, this is right ascension and declination. Each dot's a galaxy over a, a large piece of sky. And you see they're not randomly distributed again. They're just beautiful, long, arcing filament of galaxies. Here's another one here. The other thing that you notice, there are regions that are devoid of galaxies. You seem to have no galaxies here whatsoever. And I'll talk more about this in a minute, but we think what happens, of course, is that gal uh, gravity has shepherded galaxies together to create clusters of galaxies like you see here and long superclusters, filaments, but also have left behind voids, regions where there are no galaxies because the galaxies have moved into these other more populous regions in a sense, right? It's like moving from the rural region or the rural regions and everybody moving into the big city in a sense. That's kind of what gravity does in our universe. So we, we here in the Milky Way uh, or in the local group are on the outskirts of another large supercluster known as the Virgo supercluster. The Virgo cluster, I showed you a picture of that earlier, has several thousand galaxies all dancing around each other. And the Milky Way is located uh, uh, sort of on the outskirts again, the local group, but the Virgo supercluster extends over quite large distances. So it's an enormous structure, probably reaching um, hundreds of millions of light years uh, in extent. A few years ago, astronomers in India discovered another one of these enormous superclusters called Sarwasati. Sarwasati is believed to have roughly 100,000 galaxies in it. And you can see it in the central region here, this sort of over density of galaxies. Uh, it's located about 4 billion light years from Earth. The name Sarasati comes from the name of a Hindu goddess, the Hindu goddess of knowledge. Uh, so again, there's these enormous structures. And one of the questions for astronomers is, how do you form such big structures? Has there been time for gravity, the weakest of all forces, to make structures of such enormous size? And the answer is, yes, we think so. I'll explain that in a minute. But it's a pretty impressive accomplishment. Uh, there's another large supercluster. In fact, it's almost a super supercluster. Uh, called Laniakea. This was discovered a few years by Brent Tully at the University of Hawaii and his colleagues at other universities. And not only do we have the Virgo supercluster, which you can see here, but in fact, other superclusters also seem to link up into this massive structure that's been named Laniakea. Laniakea is the Hawaiian word meaning uh, immense heaven. And it also probably has hundreds of thousands of galaxies in it. And these extend over many hundreds of millions of light years. So these are enormous structures in the universe. And again, just as the map makers of centuries ago, you know, it took time to piece together what our planet looks like. Today, it takes astronomers time, but slowly but surely, we're getting a clearer image of what the universe looks like on the largest scales. And it's pretty impressive. Uh, we can also study the motions of galaxies, how they're moving through space. And it turns out that the Milky Way, the Virgo cluster, and pretty much everything in our region seems to be, it's being pulled towards some region of space, which must have a lot of mass and a lot of gravity, and it's been nicknamed the Great Attractor. But it seems as if we're all flowing in the, that direction on these incredibly large scales. By the way, uh, a few years ago, there were some people who had a clever idea. They actually sold these glass spheres called universe in a sphere, where they used a laser to etch inside of it hundreds of thousands of uh, the positions of hundreds of thousands of galaxies that have been mapped. I actually bought one I have in my office. Uh, but you can see it here, right? But the thing I want you to take from this, I think you can actually still buy them if you're interested. Um, but the thing I want you to see is this kind of frothy, filamentary, uh, appearance, you know, and, and that really seems to describe the universe almost like a honeycomb pattern uh, in some ways. And, and that's what the universe looks like on the biggest scales. Why does it have this pattern? Well, we think we actually understand that. As I said earlier, we can do computer simulations of how gravity moves matter around in an expanding universe. And this shows one of those computer simulations. And you see that the matter 
naturally tends to form into these long filamentary patterns. The yellow regions are clusters of galaxies and groups of galaxies, but you know, sort of beginning from the thinnest strands, these sort of tiny irregularities, tiny lumps in the distribution of matter in the early universe, gravity has amplified that over time in over 14 billion years to produce these kinds of filaments. Here's another illustration. This is actually a computer model showing, if you watch, it's actually evolving over time. And you can see the filamentary structure growing uh, over you know, hundreds of millions of light years uh, as, as gravity does its thing, starting from some initial slightly lumpy distribution where in some regions of space you had a few more atoms than others. Gravity likes that and amplifies it. And this is what you get if you wait 14 billion years. So that's pretty impressive. So we think we understand how these sorts of structures form. I'll point out a few interesting similarities. Um, you see similar patterns elsewhere in nature. Uh, it doesn't mean there's a connection, obviously, but it's food for thought. Uh, this shows an um, a image of neurons in a, a, the brain of a mouse. And you see, again, this kind of filamentary links between neurons, these long filamentary patterns. Here's another image of the city of Liège, Belgium at night. Uh, and you can see, again, these kind of filaments all feeding into the city, almost like you have a, a cluster of lights here and filaments uh, stretching outwards, other smaller satellite groups of, of lights over here. Uh, here's another example. This is slime mold. This is a, an image of slime mold. Slime mold is uh, it's a single-celled organism. It's an amoeba, essentially, but can also exist in colonies that grow and spread over time in search of food. And it's got this kind of filamentary pattern, oops, sorry, that you see here. Uh, in fact, I can show you here. This is a computer uh, algorithm simulation of how slime mold grows. It spreads out tentacles over time looking for new food. And as it does this, it develops a kind of filamentary pattern uh, that's not unlike what we see in a distribution of galaxies. And you might say, well, so what? It's just a coincidence, right? What does that have to do with uh, the large scale distribution of galaxies in the universe? It turns out there might actually be some connections. There's a paper published uh, within the last month where astronomers actually took models of how slime mold grows and used it to understand and better predict the filamentary distribution of galaxies on very large scales. They even published a paper. Oops, sorry. Uh, if you can see the bottom, it actually talks about using slime mold to uh, to model the filamentary, the cosmic web, essentially, the filamentary structure, the filamentary distribution of galaxies on the very largest scales. Um, so let me just quickly finish up by telling you a tiny bit about my own research. One of the things I'm interested in is, uh, you know, as human beings, we're all shaped by our environment, right? You live in a, a city and you live in a country and you live, you know, all these things influence you. You have a culture. And we're all influenced by that, by our surroundings. Well, galaxies are too. And what I'm interested in, in particular is how does a large scale environment, how does the distribution of matter on the very largest scales of the universe influence the properties of individual galaxies? And so what my colleagues and I have been doing for the last few years is looking at one particular feature of galaxies that seems to be related to or influenced by the cosmic web. And this is their orientations in space. If you look at this image here, it's a beautiful cluster of galaxies. And you see it's quite elongated. In fact, many clusters of galaxies and cities are quite elongated in shape. So if you do a line through it, it might look something like that, the long di direction. If you then look at the orientations of each of the individual galaxies, what you find is that the biggest galaxies, most of the galaxies are randomly oriented. They just point any which way. But the biggest galaxies don't. The biggest, most massive galaxies tend to share the same or very similar orientation as the city of galaxies, as a cluster of galaxies that they live in. So to us, that's quite intriguing. What it suggests is that these galaxies have been built by material 
smaller galaxies flowing along filaments and they pile up at the center. And so the galaxies, the big galaxies that get big by cannibalizing the small ones, well, they eat in preferred directions. Most of the galaxies that they cannibalize fall in or flow in along these filaments and that imprints a preferred orientation on the big galaxy that results over time. So we're doing a lot more work with that. The other thing that we're doing is what I like to call cosmic archaeology. And in this case, we're looking for the first cities of galaxies. Imagine if you were an archaeologist and you could go back in time to actually walk the streets of ancient Rome or walk the streets of ancient Greece or go back to Jericho or go back to the first human settlements to see how people live and how the first cities came to be. Well, the beauty of astronomy, of course, is that we can do that in a sense because the further we look into space, the further we look back in time because it takes time for light to travel to us. And so by looking further and further into space, my colleagues and I, my, and these are colleagues in, in Germany at Bochum University, in Finland at University of Turku and at, uh, at Harvard, uh, we're trying to find the first settlements, the first cities of galaxies that formed when the universe was still young. Here's an example of one. This is a city of galaxies, a cluster of galaxies that was seen 10 billion years ago. It's pretty hard to see because 10 billion years is looking way back in time, but that's it. These things are really faint, they're really far away, they're really hard to see. Uh, but we're trying to find more of these things. To do this, we're actually using supermassive black holes which are found at the hearts of quasars and radio galaxies. These are galaxies that light up uh, at radio wavelengths. You can see them very far away in the universe. And so we're using these as beacons to show us where the first galaxy clusters might have formed. And we're doing this using many telescopes, uh, including Lowell's Discovery Telescope, out uh, about an hour outside of uh, Flagstaff. Uh, so anyway, that's work that's in progress, but we're trying to find the very first cities of galaxies that were formed. That's all I have to say. Uh, again, let me remind you, uh, first of all, thank you for, for joining us today, and I'm happy to answer any questions in a second. And just to remind you, this is the first of a series of Meet and Astronomer Talks. Our next one will take place on Tuesday when uh, Catherine Nugent will tell us about uh, supergiant, uh, red supergiant stars. Um, and so I'm happy to answer any questions, CJ, if we have any. Yes, I can. Okay, so I'm unmuted and here to ask you some questions from the YouTube chat. Uh, our first question is from Mira Frenzel, which is, what is the evidence that dark matter is non-baryonic other than what else could it be? That's an excellent question. If I knew the answer to that one, um, no, the, so the argument, that, that's a great question, right? People often ask, why can't the dark matter just be normal stuff? Why does it have to be non-baryonic? And so for, for people that are, aren't necessarily scientists, baryons are the stuff that make up you and me and everything you see around you, the sort of normal atoms. And the belief that astronomers and physicists have is that the dark matter that we think dominates the universe can't be made of that stuff. And the simplest argument is that um, when the universe began with the Big Bang, it was extremely hot. And those conditions, which were similar to the interior of a star, would have created um, hydrogen atoms eventually, but also helium, lithium, and some deuterium and some other types of atoms. And the amount of those atoms that we should see today, those sort of byproducts of the first few hot minutes after the Big Bang, the amount that we see today depends on the amount of baryons or normal stuff that you had present in the early universe. So if you had a lot more stuff, if you had, a, if you had enough baryons to make up the dark matter today, we should see a lot more helium today in the universe. We should see a lot more deuterium today in the universe, and we don't. And so that seems to rule out the possibility that the dark matter could have been made up of baryons or, or normal matter. And that suggests that it must be made up of some kind of particle, subatomic particle, and we have no idea what it is at the moment. Or that we, we don't understand gravity. That's the other argument, of course, is there's no such thing as dark matter. We just don't understand gravity. That's another possibility. All right, thanks. 
Our next question is from Ralph Pass, which is, isn't the relative sizes of M31 and the Milky Way being continually reviewed with the consensus somewhat ambiguous between which is larger? Yes, that's a good question. That's why I always hesitate to say, I think I said 50% bigger. Um, if I gave this talk, you know, six months ago or six months from now, it, the number, so I saw something not long ago saying, no, in fact, um, the Milky Way is about the same size as Andromeda. And then, you know, a year ago, there was another one saying, oh, no, it's about twice as big. So yes, there is uncertainty with that, uh, trying to get the total mass. It, it's actually really hard to figure out the total mass of the galaxy because we don't quite know where they end. Their stars sort of peter out as you get far enough away from the center. But of course, we think they have lots of this invisible dark matter out there. And that's much harder to figure out the total size and mass of any individual galaxy. All right. Uh, next question from Jim Davies, which is, when galaxies merge, do the central black holes always merge? Great question. Uh, in principle, probably. Uh, given enough time, what would happen is, so we believe that at the center of every galaxy, almost every galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole. Our Milky Way has one, Andromeda has one. And when the galaxies merge, these supermassive black holes, which are sort of located at the center in the densest regions, should spiral together on a relatively short time scale in, in cosmic terms um, to create one larger black hole. And it's probably happened in the past as well. In fact, our Milky Way's black hole, supermassive black hole, might well have uh, been the merger of several smaller black holes when it cannibalized uh, other small galaxies in, in its past. The Milky Way probably cannibalized dozens, who knows, even hundreds of smaller galaxies. So yes, they should merge together over time. All right, uh, next question from Victoria Gerges. What are the oldest galaxies we've found and how do they differ from galaxies we see closer to today like Andromeda? That's a really good question. Um, we see galaxies looking back billions of years into the past, of course. One of the surprises was that uh, when you look further and further out, you can only see the brightest galaxies, of course, because they're, you can't see the faint ones very, very far away, halfway across the universe. But the ones that we do see, some of them are quite old, which is a bit surprising because you would think billions of years ago, you know, it's, it's, it's the adolescent years of galaxies. They're young, they're full of energy, they're forming stars, they're luminous, lit up. But we actually see some old uh, stars, it, uh, some old galaxies with old stars that aren't forming new stars today, even far in the past. So that's a bit of a puzzle. But in general, you know, what we think is that the first galaxies that formed, uh, you know, soon after the Big Bang, those are pretty quiet today. They don't have a lot of star formation going on, but some stars uh, like small dwarf galaxies, for example, that we see nearby, but which we can't see very far away, took a while for gravity to pull enough material together for them to light up and, and create stars and that kind of thing. So I guess the short answer is, um, if you think about the way we, we believe galaxies form, they've probably grown over time through cannibalism so in principle, galaxies today, on average, should be bigger than galaxies were billions of years ago. But you see some pretty big galaxies, even in the distant past. Uh, and, you know, it even goes back to the question of how did you form such large, supermassive black holes in those galaxies? And we know that those exist, too. So I think that to answer your question, Victoria, is uh, nearby we can see the, the small, faint galaxies that we can't see far away. But by and large, uh, Star formation was more energetic in the distant past, but galaxies were, you can find all kinds of galaxies at all distances. Okay, next question is from Joe Schindler. Uh, does the direction these filaments flow have to do with the momentum of the system or is there some other determining factor? That's a really good question. Uh, it's not so much the momentum of the system, although they probably impart a momentum into the, the galaxies that sit at the center of these flows. It's more what happens is if you think about the early universe and how matter was distributed, how we believe, you know, the universe is pretty smooth, atoms were distributed pretty smoothly throughout, but there were lumps and bumps everywhere. And over time, gravity amplifies these. <clears throat> and these lumps in the early universe were probably not perfectly spherical. And so if they started off aspherical, say slightly flattened, 
gravity would amplify that over time. And then you get these uh, flattened kind of filamentary structures of these walls and sheets of, of material. And then within those, gravity pulls things towards the densest regions. So you get this flow of galaxies and gas and dust and, and dark matter even uh, along these filaments to the nodes where the filaments intersect because that's where the densest regions are. That's where the gravitational pull is the greatest. Uh, so it's not so much that they're reflecting momentum per se. These filaments, if anything, are imparting momentum onto the stuff that forms within them. All right, uh, next question from Greta Owen. What are some theories about what the great attractor is? It's probably just a massive uh, supercluster, a system of uh, galaxy clusters. In fact, there are several that are already known to be part of the great attractor. I think what's a little bit surprising is just how great its pull is. Uh, but it's probably just it's just the biggest it's the biggest kid in the neighborhood basically, um, and it's got enough gravity and enough clusters of galaxies and dark matter associated with it, that it's even pulling us in. All right. Uh, from Jim Hendrickson, if you go back to the slide with the local group, are all of those dwarf galaxies going to get absorbed by the Milky Way before the Milky Way merges with Andromeda? Sorry, it may take me too long to go. Oh. Um, no, not, not before necessarily, but certainly uh, at some point, Sorry, here we go. Well, so there's a local group, for example. Uh, so the Milky Way for sure will cannibalize some of these small dwarfs. Whether it will do that before we merge with Andromeda is not 100% clear. Uh, there was a great paper a few years ago by uh, Duncan Forbes and his colleagues where they looked at to, to a point in the distant future when every galaxy in the local group has merged into one big uh, final galaxy. And you know, it, it looks a lot like that, those big elliptical galaxies I showed you earlier, that cannibal, for example, that was in the process of eating many of its neighbors. Um, so undoubtedly, you know, for example, the Milky Way may well cannibalize the large small Magellanic cloud at some point. Um, it's certainly in the process of cannibalizing uh, other galaxies right now, but the exact time scale isn't 100% known. And whether it will do this before we merge with Andromeda is not 100% clear. Either way, it's not gonna be good for the dwarf galaxies. All right, well, uh, that concludes all the questions that I have from the chat that were fed to me. So I think we're all set. Great, well, thanks very much for joining us today, everybody. And remember next Tuesday, uh, we'll have a talk with Catherine Nugent uh, at 2 p.m. as well. So please join us for that.